everybody, it is Dean Z, and I am speaking to you today from the Jeffries Lounge, which happens to be one of my very favorite rooms in the law school. It is where students come to study quietly as opposed to studying more noisily in a couple other spaces we have uh, in another building. But it's very beautiful and serene in here. So uh, I'm glad to be in here, and I'm going to talk to you today about rankings, specifically US News and World Report rankings. I have been very grateful for everybody who's written in questions since we started uh, filming new videos this season. But I had noted that almost nobody, well, nobody for a long time, asked anything about rankings. And I thought that was curious because they've changed a lot in the last couple of years. And I am used, when I was first dean of admissions, you know, in 2001, Rankings took on enormous weight, and people, like everybody, was, knew all the movements, right? So students would talk about it, faculty would talk about it, and I have noticed a sort of diminution in interest over the years. So I, I, you know, I, I think that is reflected in the fact that people haven't reached out to ask me to, to talk about it. But finally, somebody did. One person asked about whether schools will treat something differently because of a, a change in the methodology. I'll get to that. But I figured, OK, this is great. Now I get to talk about rankings, because someone asked me about it. So let's get started. All right, I mentioned that things have changed a lot in the last couple of years. And that's because in, we are in 2024 right now. So in 2022, I think in November of 2022, uh, a number of law schools made the decision to no longer calculate and gather together information that was otherwise not information we were preparing to produce and give to US News to, in order to undergird their for-profit rankings. This, this movement started with Yale Law School uh, and others quickly jumped on the bandwagon, including Michigan. Um, I, I, I always thought it was slightly perplexing that we put so much effort and time into gathering data that we would send you know, for free to this for-profit entity that was doing something that um, you know, I always found mildly annoying, to be very honest, because uh, I think Michigan is, <laughs> the ranking should be Michigan and every other law school like 10 feet below. I mean, maybe I'm biased. I've, people have told me that. Uh, I kid. But, it, you know, it's like, you know, no one loves the rankings, uh, even if you think they're basically getting it right. Um, so the idea that we'd put all this work into it was always a little perplexing to me. So I was on board with the decision not to participate uh, in, in providing the information. Um, it, but that made US News have to change a lot what their methodology was, because a lot of the information that they had been relying on could no longer be relied on. So things are much different today. I will say. One of the questions I wanted to answer in preparing for this is how many schools are participating or not in US News these days? And it's a little hard to get the answer to that. US News itself, I'm going to quote what they say. They say that they survey nearly 200 law schools and 144 responded. Um, so that makes it sound like basically 25% of schools are not participating in this. But then elsewhere, they suggest that if a school takes publicly available data and fills out the form and gives that to them, they'll count them as participating, even though they're not giving the private data. And so I don't know if that 144 is, includes that group, or if it's just I mean, I just don't know what it includes. And, uh, you know, and, and a couple articles I read said, like, despite many questions, US News has not really shed any light on that question. So I think we're safe in saying at least one quarter of US law schools are not providing uh, the, the data that they used to to US News. So what changed as a result? It used to be that uh, a big factor in the rankings was dollars per pupil sent, uh, uh, spent, rather. And that is no longer a factor, because that was one of the pieces that was sort of proprietary that schools had to put together for US News. Uh, and that was a big chunk of it, and it's not part of it anymore. Another big chunk of it was reputational scores. And US News made a decision that if a school was not giving other information to them, they also couldn't participate in filling out the reputational scores. So 
that's a big chunk of information that has now been, it's still part of it, but has now been decreased in value or, 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 or weight. So then that means other things had to increase in value and weight. So what changed? Uh, one of the factors that increased, basically everything that increased is outcome information, like jobs and bar passage. So employment outcomes after 10 months are now worth a third of the total ranking, but that is about twice as much as in 2022 and before. Uh, first time bar passage used to be 3%, now it's 18%, so 16, six times what it used to be. And then finally, ultimate bar passage, which is after two years, how many people have passed the bar after two years if they didn't pass it on the first go round? That didn't used to be a factor at all, and now it is worth 7%. Uh, so all told, these outcomes are worth 58% when previously they had been roughly 20%. Um, in addition to the factors that are, are now no longer included at all, other factors, um, decreased, so I mentioned the assessment scores. So peer assessment, which is what other law schools think of law schools, it used to be 25% of the ranking. Now it's 12.5%. And then assessments by lawyers and judges used to be 15%, and now it too is 12.5%. So both of those decreased, but now they're equal, which makes more sense to me than the heavily weighting of, uh, that used to happen of law school uh, assessments. You can make the case that while law schools know each other better than um, lawyers and judges know law schools, maybe, but no law school, like you tend to know the schools that are your peer schools, right? So, you know, I might know um, a lot about University of Virginia, but I probably don't know a lot about a school that I have no overlap with um, that is uh, situated in a, you know, a different part of the rankings, right? Uh, so if I'm filling out this form, I don't know that my opinion about those other schools is worth anything at all. And while you might say lawyers and judges know less, they, they, their assessment, even if, even if it's ill-informed, their take on how um, uh, you know, well-regarded a law school is, is actually monumentally important to the people looking for jobs. Like if uh, you know, a law firm thinks this is the greatest school ever, uh, does it matter if they are wrong? It's sort of a philosophical kind of question, metaphysical, right? But that, that should carry a lot of weight to people. So I think that's, I like that they're the same weight now. Uh, but it used to be, as I say, 40%, now it's 25%. And finally, all the admissions factors decreased a lot in ranking. Uh, so LSAT and GPA and acceptance rate used to be worth 20% and now are worth only 10%. That's a little mysterious to me because that is publicly available data, easy for US News to get. So I, they've never, as far as I can find, I find no explanation for why they decided to decrease um, their weight from 20% to 10. I've got no particular beef with that. I just think it's interesting. And there is a school of thought out there that US News ranks schools based on what they think the ranking should be, and then they figure out the methodology afterwards. I am sure that is not literally true, but the fact that they make changes and don't explain why tends to feed into that um, conspiracy theory. Okay, just to round out the factors that are being taken into account, the other two are student-faculty ratio, which is 5%, used to be 2%, and then the all-important library resources, which used to be 2%, uh, which are now 2%, but used to be 1%, so uh, those two increased in weight. Uh, okay. The result of all these changes has been uh, you know, some fairly significant shifting around. Um, you know, within the schools that I am looking at most closely, because they're the schools that we have the most overlap with, where people are applying to Michigan and those other schools, or, and choosing between Michigan and those other schools in large numbers. Uh, the shifting has been sort of by spots as opposed to you know, nobody went from, you know, ranked five to ranked 25. Like, everybody's in the, still in the same basic place, but there's, uh, there's been a lot of shifting around, and there's been a lot of clumping, which I, I honestly, I kind of like, right? Because I think it means, uh, I mean, I think a more rational way to rank 
would be to put groups of like schools together, um, as opposed to this false uh, precision of this school is one, this school is two, this school is three. Uh, I think that's a little misleading. So I, I, would, I like this idea of, you know, maybe they'll move more in this direction uh, to, to put people in tiers, which is how a lot of law school ranking, a law firm rankings work, by the way. So interestingly. Um, so we have four schools this year that are ranked number four. We have three schools that are ranked number nine. We have three schools that are ranked 16. We have one, two, three, four schools that are ranked 20, and so forth. Um, I think, you know, ultimately that could be either U.S. News le leans into that and just goes in that direction, or, you know, if they, if they keep trying to give this ranking but have all these clumps, I don't know, I think that sort of diminishes the people's sense of their validity. Okay. Some criticisms of the new methodology um, are that uh, this, this is not specific to me. I've done some research about this. But uh, they are averaging the uh, ultimate bar passage rates and the first time bar passage rates and employment outcomes over two years. They just started doing that this year. Uh, and they said they did it to control for the law schools that have small class sizes. OK, maybe. But the, the small class sizes have always existed. So it's a little like, why didn't you do that before? Again, this, this suggests that the change in methodology maybe has more to do with uh, US news trying to reach a certain result than it does with you know, rankings integrity. Um, and also, I will say, the small class size, that's a problem for all elements of the ranking. It throws everything off. Um, you know, a median in a, in a class of, of 50 is a much different thing than a median that's in a class of 300. It, it, it has much less weight and it's probably like, you know, it's probably, it can fluctuate a lot more with, with fewer changes um, when you have a smaller class. And they don't say anything about why they're not averaging data for two years for all factors. Another criticism that I, I don't know, I don't take quite as much issue with has to do with the ranking for bar passage. So first time passage is ranked more than twice as much as ultimate bar passage. And a lot of people say, well, that's not right because what's really important is do, you know, do the graduates of the school pass the bar eventually? Um, that is important, but it is, you know, if you're a law student and you aren't passing the bar on the first time, that's not ideal. Uh, you have to then take it again. You, you can't get a job as a fully fledged lawyer until you've passed the bar. So it's a lot of time and a lot of money lost. And, you know, I don't, I don't think it is um, terribly significant about a person not passing the bar. But if, if a school has, you know, a 50% first time bar passage rate, that is a different experience and a different outcome than a school that has a 95% first time bar passage rate. So it makes sense to me that you might weight the first time passage heavily. But I understand that's an argument that people are making. I'm going to quote um, somebody on this, someone named Aaron Taylor, who is the executive director, director of Access Lex Institute. And he says, first time passage remains the ideal outcome, but the issue remains that the rankings judge schools based on the narrow conception of success that inherently disadvantages schools, providing the lion's share of opportunities to talented people from underrepresented backgrounds. There are a number of schools conferring immense value on students, the profession, and our democracy that will nonetheless never fail well on this. Never fare well on this list. I totally agree with what he's saying. And yet. That's kind of a criticism of the whole undertaking of rankings, not so much the first time passage versus ultimate bar passage. Like, there are 200 law schools out there, and they, you know, they all have merit and value for many of their students. They all you know, allow people to pursue a job as a JD, a, be, to be an, a lawyer. And you know, it does arguably makes no sense that you're ranking these schools uh, at all. And so I feel like his criticism 
is dead on, but is actually much broader than he has aimed at. OK, so that's, I think, all I want to say about like, the methodology of the US News. And now I want to get to the question that was asked of me that inspired me to do this episode, which was, are law schools admissions offices going to be looking differently at candidates now that, now that the um, admissions criteria of LSAT and GPA are diminished in value, but the employment information has increased in value? Are you going to really be looking for people who can get jobs? And, and how are you going to assess that? I think it's a really great question. I think that is and a really interesting one. On the first, on one hand, I will say there are a lot of reasons why schools care about LSAT and GPA that are completely independent of the rankings. I say this as someone who applied to law school in an era largely before the rankings be, took on any weight at all. They had just sort of um, started. They were very new when I was applying to law school. And I can tell you that I knew law schools cared about the LSAT, even though they weren't, weren't being ranked on that criterion. Um, so I, I don't think the LSAT and GPA stuff is going to go away entirely. But yeah, at the margins, I can imagine a, a, a rational admissions office is going to make a decision between, if this guy has a higher LSAT, uh, but has never had a job, and this person has a slightly lower LSAT, but still clearly can do the work, and they've got this great employment history. I can, the rational decision, if you're really caring about rankings, is to get, choose this person. And frankly, that may be the rational decision in a complete absence of rankings, too. Uh, not maybe, almost certainly is the right rational decision. Uh, but I don't think, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you I think the whole admissions process is getting upended. I think that people are still going to care about LSAT and GPA. But I do think they will increase their interest in whether a candidate looks employable. And I think that it is in a candidate's best interest to make sure their resume reflects everything that be, could be counted as relevant experience, and that you seek out relevant experience. I mean, that's, this is really very consistent with advice I have been giving since you know, the dawn of time. But I just want to emphasize it here. I think this is you know, something that uh, candidates should be thinking about, and that people with very high numbers who haven't pursued any kind of employment opportunities, whether in school or after graduation, they're going to see you know, the effect in their, their outcomes. Um, and, you know, it may increase a smidge compared to what it used to be. So I would encourage people to be thinking about that when they're putting their materials together. And possibly, if, if you don't have a great record on this, it might be worth waiting a year and, and accumulating some experience. To be clear, it doesn't have to be law-based experience, but, you know, it's something that shows us you are, you understand the professional world, you are a hard worker. You understand what it is to be an employee. You've probably gone through some interviews, stuff like that. I think a lot of law schools are going to be putting a lot of attention on that. All right, and I think that's all I have to say about rankings. I hope that was useful and interesting. And now for the language section of the uh, episode. And I'm pretty excited about this one. Where is it? I want to talk to you about the word sanction and its ilk. What do I mean by that? The word sanction means itself, it means one thing and the opposite of that thing. So it means both a penalty for disobeying a rule. You know, I sanctioned you because you were stealing signs. I don't know where I came up with that example. I've heard about it somewhere. Or it means, or and I should say, it means official approval or permission uh, of an action. So it means this and not this. That, I looked that up because it's like, there has to be a word, a, name, a word for that kind of word, and there is. It's called a, a contronym. Uh, and another term that sometimes gets used is a Janus word, J-A-N-U-S. And um, that's a I think, Roman mythology? Oh, I didn't look that up. But it, it means basically someone who's two-faced. So I didn't look that up, but you can look it up if you're interested. So. Be very careful when you're reading a sentence with the word sanction in it that you know which kind of sanction is being referred to, because you could really get confused there. All right. That's all I have to say today. Uh, as always, thank you to Dustin, even though he said at the beginning of this episode, oh, you're shorter than I thought you were, and he had to adjust the camera. So that was a little hurtful. But whatever, I'm past it. Anyway, thank you to Dustin. And as always, uh, please send 
you know, any ideas or questions you have to law.jd.admissions at umich.edu and put log in the subject line. And then, or you could use some comments below and we'll try to respond to those. And uh, yeah, wherever you go, go blue.